Hello again. It's January 1984. It's been six months since we did the last tape, and we thought it was time with all the new information that we've gathered to put a new tape together. This tape is going to be divided into four parts. The first part is going to cover some church history with an eye toward demystifying the locations of the ship, the locations of church headquarters, and where Ron has been living during the past approximately 15 years. Part two of the tape is going to take a look at key moments in church history, that is, those moments that have led to the takeover of the church by the RTC and principally by the individuals David Miscavige and Pat and Annie Broker. Part three is going to take a look at those management personnel. We're going to learn a little bit more about them, a little bit more about their Scientology background, their educational background, and their history in the church. Part four of the tape is going to cover Ron's Journal 38. We're going to take a look at the stats and the statements on that tape, and we're going to look at the question of whether or not the voice you hear on that tape is or is not LRH. Over the years, there's been a lot of interest and a lot of mystery surrounding the ships that belonged to the Sea Org, where they were, what they were doing, and so on. So we thought we'd spend a few minutes and look into them. The principal ship, the flagship of the fleet, was a ship called the Royal Scotsman. The Royal Scotsman was a converted channel ferry, that is, a ferry that went back and forth across the English Channel. That ship was converted by the church into what was, in essence, a private yacht, and it sailed on its first major church expedition from the port of Southampton, England, on the 28th of November, 1967. Also in the church fleets were, were two other yachts. One was called the Enchanter. That was a much smaller vessel that was a sailing yacht that was equipped with auxiliary engines as well and another converted commercial boat that was called the Avon River. All three of the boats were in the Mediterranean during the bulk of the year 1968, and the flagship, that is the Royal Scotsman, spent the bulk, bulk of its time near the island of Corfu. During the months of September through October 1968, the Class 8 lectures were given on that ship, on the Royal Scotsman, while it was stationed in Corfu. And if you listen carefully to the tapes, and I hope you have the opportunity to hear them, you can hear harbor noises in the background, ships' horns and so on. During the remainder of the year 1968 and the bulk of the year 1969, the ships continued to sail about on various missions in the Mediterranean. In September of 1969, the ships joined together in the island of Corfu. At that time, there was an attempt by the church to establish a St. Hill and an AO on the island of Corfu. It was to be called the University of Philosophy. On the 18th of November, 1969, in a great PR move, the church decided to rename the three ships in honor of various Greek historical figures. The Royal Scotsman was renamed the Apollo, the Avon River was renamed Athena, and the Enchanter that had earlier been renamed Diana was christened Diana, all in a big ceremony for the officials on the island. From that point on, however, things started to come apart. The ship had been traveling under an assumed name of the Operation Transport Corporation, and that cover blew off. It was found out that the church really was representative of the Church of Scientology. Additionally, in the month of March of 1970, the newspapers were told by someone on the ship that the Greek government was endorsing the opening of this new church facility. Of course, the government was not endorsing the opening of that facility, and that made them quite angry. That plus a combination of difficulties that were encountered in the harbor with the ship not uh, observing proper etiquette led to the ship being ordered out of Corfu Harbor and all Scientologists and the staff and so forth ordered off the island in, in March of 1970. During the remainder of the year 1970, the ship continued to sail about in the Mediterranean, but flap after flap in ports made it very clear that the ship was not going to be able to remain in the Mediterranean for long. In 1971, it spent the bulk of the year sailing in the East Atlantic between the ports at, uh, and the countries of Morocco and Portugal and Spain, sailing through such ports as Lisbon and Setubal. In Morocco, they landed in Tangiers. They sailed also to the island of Madeira and around in the Canary Islands. During that time, the TRC, which was a translation unit, was set up in Tangiers, and an estate was taken there where Ron and Mary Sue lived. This was good living quarters for them, and that was a comparatively settled period of time. The ship was put into dry dock in Lisbon in 1972, and it was there some time for repairs. At the end of the year, 1972, those missions would go sour. 
The stories surrounding why those missions went sour vary considerably, and it's really hard to know exactly why. But it seems clear that what those missions were doing was that they were spying on government officials, gathering up uncomplimentary information, and that cover was blown off. No matter what occurred, on the 3rd of December, 1972, the entourage with LRH was given 24 hours to leave the island. During the day of December 3rd, all the papers, receipts, and so forth that were there at the facility were shredded and burned, and at 5 p.m., LRH got on a plane and flew to Lisbon, Portugal. There he was joined by Jim Dinkelsey and Paul Preston, and the three of them flew on to New York City. Within a couple of days, they'd taken an apartment in Queens, New York, in a building called The Executive. Queens, New York, by the way, is a suburb of New York City. In February 1983, they moved to a larger apartment, again in Queens, New York, on a street called Codwise Place. All three were operating under assumed names during that time. Jim Dinkelsey was called Frank Morris, Paul Preston was using the name Don Shannon, and LRH was using the name Lawrence Harris. LRH was working on the Volunteer Minister's Program at that time, a Guardian's Office project called Snow White, and the photo check sheet on subject control, that is, how to control the subject that you're photographing. Ron remained in this area until September of 1973. On September the 18th, he flew back to Lisbon and rejoined the ship. The ship continued at that time sailing about in the East Atlantic, again between the Canary Islands, Madeira, and Portugal and Spain. In December of 1973, on the island of Tenerife, LRH breaks his arm. The recovery from that broken arm is going to be long and difficult, and it'll take approximately three months. This is a terribly unpleasant time for him and all of those people that are around him. The ship will continue to sail around in the eastern Atlantic until October the 9th, 1974. On that day, the ship was in Madeira, and that's the day of the now-famous Rock Festival. The Apollo Stars, the musical group that traveled with the ship, were doing a concert in town. Those people assigned to the sound system for the Apollo Stars walked among the crowd listening to the sound, but also caught the idea that there was something going to happen at the ship that afternoon. No one was entirely clear as to exactly what it was. They sent a message back to the ship. Now, the ship was on liberty at that time. That meant that about half the crew was ashore, but LRH himself was on board. What actually had happened was that a local newspaper man had uncovered the fact that individuals from the church had been spying on officials on the island. This had been exposed, and an agitator had gotten together a group of people in a local park and had gotten them all fired up about the Ultra CIA, or the Ultra CIA, that was called, and that meant that they assumed that the ship was another CIA. At any rate, late in the afternoon, a crowd gathered on the dock right below the Apollo. The docks there were made out of paving stones or cobbles, and they began picking up these small stones and hurling them at the ship. And in fact, this stoning of the ship went on for some hours. In an attempt to drive the crowd back, the sea hoses of the ship were gotten out. Those are hoses that pump seawater and they were going to spray in order to drive it back further on the dock. Unfortunately, they were not able to gather sufficient water pressure to really do anything but infuriate the crowd by getting them wet, and the crowd took all the rolling stock of the ship, the automobiles, the motorcycles, and the bicycles, and threw it all into the sea. At any rate, it seemed hopeless at that point. The ship simply dropped its lines and sailed away from the dock, dropped anchor a little ways away. The following day, October the 10th, the ship took on food and fuel, announced to the port officials that it was going to be sailing to Buenos Aires, and set off. That night, when it was dark, all lights on the ship were turned off, and they changed their course to a northwesterly course headed for Charleston, South Carolina. Their arrival there was to be a secret. They were going to be totally out of communication for the next ten days, and would sail all those days with no radio contact, lights off, and so on. However, when the ship was about eight miles off the coast of Charleston, five miles outside the three-mile limit, they received a radio message that the FBI was waiting for them on the dock. Their landing at Charleston was to be a secret, and it was a mystery for some time how the FBI found out they were coming. 
In fact, they found out because the Apollo stars had a pre-mission which had been sent to Charleston, as they did to all the ports where the ship was headed, and then announced broadly and set up musical performances for the Apollo stars, told everyone the Apollo was coming in order to generate enthusiasm and excitement, and that is how the FBI found out. At any rate, the ship turned and sailed to Bermuda. During the next few days, the Portugal Telex relay offices of the church are raided. However, the Portuguese officials are held off and all the Telexes and other materials are shredded and burned before they can fall into these, quote, unfriendly hands, close quote. Peter Warren was the person on the ship who was doing the spying operations that all these papers had to be burned and shredded to prevent the officials of various governments from seeing. The idea was that the ships were trying to find a safe place. A safe place for Scientology would be a place where the government of a particular country or at least of an island would either endorse Scientology or promise to hold it safe from its enemies. When these ports would blow up or when the governments or officials of these places seemed reluctant to endorse Scientology, these spies of the church would go to work trying to dig up information on the officials that could either be used to one, find out why they were opposed to Scientology, or two, and more likely of the two, could be used to blackmail them to indeed go ahead and endorse and or agree to protect the church. At any rate, the ship was in Bermuda for about two weeks, and that caused a flap. They had to leave Bermuda, and from there they sailed to Nassau. Again, they were in Nassau for about two weeks, and that port flapped, and they sailed on down into the Caribbean. During the bulk of the year, 1975, the ship sails about in the Caribbean. It's a fairly quiet time, and although there are flaps in almost every port where the ship lands, for the most part, those flaps are minor. The only flap that was really a, a major flap was the flap in Trinidad, and that was another occasion where the ship was ordered to be off the island and out of the port within 24 hours. In the month of June or July of 1975, while the ship is at the island of Curacao, LRH has a stroke. He's rushed from the ship, placed in the intensive care unit at a local hospital where he remains for two days, and is thereafter moved into a private room in that same hospital where he stays for three weeks. For the next three months, he undergoes his recovery. He stays at a cabana-type bungalow, which is part of the Hilton Hotel there on Curacao. During the recovery, as he begins to regain mobility and strength, photo shoot missions are t undertaken on the island, including the photos that you have seen in the front of the Volunteer Minister's Handbook. However, the ship is running out of ports, fuel is terribly expensive, and the cost of maintaining and running the ship are absolutely oppressive, and the decision is made that it's time to relocate on land. In October of 1975, the ship sails to Freeport in the Bahamas, and the crew is divided into three groups. The management group is flown to New York City, where they establish a management post at what was called RONI, the Relay Office New York, that was on the fifth floor of the New York Org. A second group is flown to Miami, and a third group is flown to what I think was Washington, D.C. The remaining two groups, the Flag Service Org and the Photo Shoot Org, traveled by bus from wherever they landed to Daytona. In uh, late October of 1975, they collected in Daytona, where they stayed in a motel on the beach. LRH took rooms in the hotel next door to that motel. At this time, the group called the United Churches was established. United Churches was a front group that the church used for purchasing property in Clearwater, Florida. When the Fort Harrison Hotel was ready for use, the crew moved to the Fort Harrison, and LRH moved to a block of apartments called King Arthur's Court in a small town called Dunedin, a small town north of Clearwater on Route 19A. A whole section of apartments was taken there, and it was nicknamed UCE, or United Churches Extension. While LRH is staying there, he decides that he needs some new clothes, and he gets in communication with a tailor from another small town nearby called Tarpon Springs. This tailor comes to visit him and begins measuring and fitting clothes for him, and the two of them get into a discussion of science fiction. This tailor is a science fiction fan, knows of LRH's work, and is very, very excited to have met and shake him, shaken hands with LRH. He goes back to Tarpon Springs and tells everybody he knows of his exciting afternoon. News of this travels rather quickly. 
And the word gets back to a reporter on the St. Petersburg Times, a lady named Betty Orsini. And she, following up the lead, discovers that LRH is indeed living in Dunedin, this small town quite near St. Petersburg, and blows the lid off the United Church's cover of the Church of Scientology purchase of the Fort Harrison and other buildings in downtown Clearwater. This breach of security is, of course, unacceptable to LRH, and in the middle of the night, he, Jim Dinkowski, Kemma, and Mike Douglas all head for Washington, D.C. There, an apartment is taken where LRH and this crew live for the next five to six months. This is not the end of flaps, however, for UCE, for apparently in their haste to leave, a box of guns was left behind. This box of guns had apparently entered the country illegally in a shipment of freight from the Bahamas to Clearwater that was part of the project of finally shipping all the crew's materials back to the States. Nonetheless, the church was eventually able to handle this flap. They paid a fine and surrendered some of the guns to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, as we understand it. As we said earlier, LRH will stay in this apartment in Washington, D.C. for five to six months. During this time, another location is found for him in California, and he moves to a location which is known as Astra. Astra was located in Culver City, California, a city which is part of the Los Angeles metropolitan area near the Los Angeles airport. This location of LRH was part of a three-part network of special telex links that were built out of special decoder boxes. There were three of them. The one where LRH was was known as Astra. The one that was in Clearwater was originally called LECCW. That meant LRH External Com Clearwater. That name was eventually changed to CECCW or CMO External Com CW in order to protect the untruth that LRH was not communicating with the church and was completely off the lines. The third of these sites was known as Beta. That was the United States Guardian's office that was located in the manor here in Los Angeles. LRH was in Astra for approximately two months. He then moved to a location that was scouted and found for him by Duke Snyder in a town called La Quinta. La Quinta is a town about 15 miles east of Palm Springs, just west of Highway 111. The location that was found was a hacienda, and the hacienda was called Rifle. At Rifle was LRH, Mary Sue, the household unit, the messengers, Fred Hare, Ann and Jim Mulligan, Duke Snyder, and Laurel and Fred Watson. The R factor on Rifle was that there was to be no connection with Scientology in any way. No books, no Scientology words, and no Scientology conversation. Everyone there had to use cover names. The first months when LRH was at Rifle were spent principally relaxing and working in the gardens. This was a period of vacation time for him. He was working on targets that he had set for himself in terms of improving his health, and toward the end of this two-month period, he began to become more active. LRH remains in La Quinta through until July of 1977. As you may recall, on the 7th of July, 1977, the FBI raided the churches in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., and Ron and Mary Sue spent the next week discussing exactly how they were going to handle their legal situation that had been created as a result of those raids. On the 15th of July, 1977, L.R.H. makes a decision. He decides he's going to leave La Quinta. With him, he takes Dee Dee Riesdorf, Claire Rousseau, and Pat Broker. Of course, we'll hear more from Pat later. They leave in the station wagon called Beauty in the middle of the night with their lights off. Once they're an adequate distance away, they turn their lights on and they make their way to Sparks, Nevada, a small town just east of Reno. LRH is ill during the trip. He's having stomach trouble, and this is not a happy trip for anybody, particularly considering the circumstances under which it's being made. They take a hotel in Sparks. Pat and Claire Russo, under assumed names, get married to each other. Both, of course, were already married. Claire Russo was married to David, and Pat was married at that time to his second wife, Trudy. It takes a few days for them to get established, but Pat and Claire go out, they find an apartment, they furnish it, they get all the necessary pots, pans, food, and so forth, and they all move into the apartment. 
The cover story is that Pat and Claire are this young married couple. LRH is their elderly grand, el elderly uncle, and that I think Dee Dee is their cousin, something like that. At any rate, they are almost completely out of calm for nearly six months. This is a time where LRH is spending time working on his health. He takes long walks every morning, and he works on the scripts for Revolt in the Stars, the film that he wrote, and also the films for the text scripts. After they'd been in Sparks a short time, cash was becoming a problem. So Pat Broker contacted Annie, his soon-to-be wife, who is the DCO CMO CW, that is, the Deputy Commanding Officer of the Commodore's Messenger Org in Clearwater. They arranged between them for $1 million in cash to be taken from the church by Annie, who will meet Pat in the Los Angeles airport where they were exchanged suitcases. They will each have a matching suitcase. They'll meet each other. Each will be disguised in some fashion. They will then, Annie will travel back to Clearwater. Pat will travel back to, to Sparks. And they will go through a variety of costume and, and disguise changes on the way. The money indeed arrives at Sparks but they are still uncertain as to whether or not the money has been adequately laundered and so they take the hundred dollar bills which is how the bulk of the money arrived and they take it to the various casinos and break the bills into smaller ones as the money is needed they will stay in sparks until the last day of december nineteen seventy seven and then they will head back for rifle in the town of la quinta on the second of january nineteen seventy eight lrh arrives back La Quinta, by the way, was called W or WHQ. That stood for Winter Headquarters. It consisted of simply more than the rifle hacienda. It also included the Olive Trees Ranch, which was the hacienda immediately next door. Additionally, since the film unit was now going to begin, additional property was needed. Two large ranches were located in Indio, California. One was 140 acres of grapefruit and date palms called Silver, the other was much smaller, a 10-acre grapefruit and date palm uh, hacienda called Monroe. The crew that was assembled to make the films would eventually live at Monroe, and in the middle of silver, right in the middle of the grapefruit orchards, a huge barn would be built that would disguise the in, its internal structure, which was actually a studio. The film crew, then called Cine, moved to the barracks in Monroe, and work on the films began at that time. However, in September of 1978, LRH has another major incident with his health. It's unclear as to whether or not he had had a heart attack or a stroke, but we do know that David Mayo, who was at that time the senior CS flag, was summoned from flag to rifle to audit LRH on assists and other actions. LRH's physician, Dr. Gene Dank, was in attendance when David arrived. He pronounced LRH very seriously ill with vital signs very, very low. He said that LRH's heart was arrhythmic, that is to say it was not beating in a smooth rhythmic fashion, and had prepared the facilities necessary to give him electric shocks to restart his heart in the event that it should stop. David was told that he could die at any moment. LRH's folders were reviewed and an assist program was written. Ron was conscious at that time, but just barely, and could just barely speak. The assists went on for some weeks, and LRH quite rapidly recovered. I think it's interesting to note that from those assists came the seeds that eventually became knots. In October of 1978, SHQ, or Summer Headquarters, was purchased. SHQ is the facility that's also known as Gilman Hot Springs and included that resort and also the motel known as the Massacre Canyon Inn, a foreshadowing name if there ever was one. Both these facilities are located on Route 79, about six miles south of Route 10. To find them, if you find Palm Springs, California, they are about 20 miles to the west. Gilman Hot Springs included a 27-hole golf course and a variety of other facilities that would be appropriate to a resort. The total purchase price for both was $2.7 million, and the church paid for them in cash. LRH had huge offices that were reno renovated and constructed for him at Gilman, as well as a house that was renovated for his use called Bonnie View. However, neither of them were ever used. In March of 79, with LRH still staying at La Quinta, a flap occurred in terms of security. 
a member of the film crew blew and made threats about coming back with authorities and with a gun and so forth. And so LRH was forced to flee La Quinta. He takes off with Mike and Kemma Douglas to a small community about 20 miles south of Riverside, California, called Lake Elsinore. Lake Elsinore is actually a lake up in the San Bernardino Mountains. There they take a trailer or an apartment or a small house, it's unclear, but they will stay there approximately a month or so. The next LRH location is a place called X. X was an apartment rented in a small town called Hemet. Hemet is the town closest to Gilman Hot Springs. It's on Route 74 near the intersection of Route 79. Hemet and Gilman Hot Springs are just a full, just a few miles apart. The apartment is behind the acupuncture clinic on Florida Street in downtown Gilman. Two apartments are taken there. One LRH lives in, one is for the messengers and the other people accompany him. In late April 1979, David Mayo, who is at that time the senior CS International, is stationed at Gilman Hot Springs. He's called to come to X to again give assists and auditing to Ron. Ron has had a cancer operation on the front of his head and needs to have some assists, as anyone would, I suppose, if they'd had an operation. The two worked together doing the assists and later on refining the knots procedure. We haven't said anything about Happy Valley, so it might be an appropriate time to speak of it just briefly. Happy Valley is a small facility about eight miles west of Gilman Hot Springs. To get there, you have to travel through the Saboba Indian Reservation. Happy Valley, by the way, is just its nickname. The reason it got that name is because it has only one telephone, and that telephone is about 100 yards away from where people sleep. You see, when you're in the Sea Org, you can be awakened at any time of the day or night to be put back on post to do some work, to answer questions, and so forth. Happy Valley got its name because you could go there and sleep and be actually happy. In February 1980, David Mayo and LRH are in constant communication. Ron is now working on his solo knots and is sending the folders and the daily sessions back and forth to David Mayo for him to see. David is also acting as Ron's review auditor on occasion when that's necessary. They have a few face-to-face -face meetings during this period of time, but at this moment the Tampa Grand Jury is about to convene. LRH and the brokers take off for parts unknown, and that was the last time they were ever seen. There have been some rumors as to where LRH has been since that time. The most likely of those rumors indicates that he's living in Laguna Beach. Since his physician, Gene Dank, has his offices here in Los Angeles, that seems a not unreasonable place, given the fact that as anyone gets older, they need an increasing amount of medical care. However, we've been unable to pin down a specific location, and we've been unable to confirm the fact that Laguna is actually where he's living. Additional rumors have also circulated that his health has been poor during the last year or so, and that perhaps he's had another stroke. But again, this is just another rumor, and we've been unable to confirm it. In part two of this tape, we said we'd take a look at those key moments that brought the brokers and Miscavige, and ultimately the RTC, into complete control of the church. I think what is observable is that the brokers and Miscavige, starting perhaps as early as 1977, begin to systematically eliminate all of LRH's comm lines except their own. Gradually, every single person with whom Ron has a comm line, including his wife and children, must communicate via the brokers. Finally, the brokers are the only ones in direct communication with Ron, and that, of course, is the situation in which we find ourselves today. The first of these key moments occurs in October 1975 when the flag land base is established. At that time, Ron feels that he must go into seclusion, and is this concern and this worry about his being a secluded figure that makes him vulnerable to Pat Broker. Also at that time, Mary Sue, who is the controller of the church, is of course on financial lines as would be expected, and Pat Broker is also on financial lines only from the viewpoint of the Sea Org rather than from the viewpoint of the Guardian's office. He and Mary Sue have some very significant flaps, and she has him busted off several posts during this time. On the 15th of July, 1977, after the Washington, D.C. raids, Ron, of course, leaves Rifle and goes into hiding with Dee Dee Riesdorf, Claire Rousseau, and Pat Broker. This is the point where Pat Broker establishes himself as a terminal to LRH and really impresses LRH with his ability to deal with and handle security. 
This also is the point where Pat begins to cut the communication line between LRH and Mary Sue by editing the letters that are going back and forth between them. Early, of course, in 1978, another one of these events occurs when Ron returns to rifle. Mary Sue, who was, was under the close scrutiny of the FBI and the government as a result of the raids, and it was necessary for her to keep her address reported to the government, had to leave rifle so that Ron's location would again be secure. Once again, this places other people as vias on the comm line between Ron and Mary Sue because it was felt that Mary Sue's mail might be traced and followed back to LRH. The next of these key moments occurs in September 1978. That was the point at which LRH was taken so terribly ill, and Ron's, quote, delicate, close quote, condition was yet another excuse to keep all this, quote, bad news off of his lines. This was an additional excuse that Ron's incoming communication could be further edited. In mid-1979, Annie Broker is the deputy commanding officer of the Commodore's Messenger Org in Clearwater, Florida. Mary Sue is living in Florida at that time, and she's operating out of the Guardian's office there. Annie is meddling in the Guardian's office affairs, and Mary Sue eventually has had it with her and forces her off the post. She gets busted for meddling in geo affairs and is sent back to Int as useless on management lines. In September the 1st, 1979, the major change in church management occurs. The CMO International takes over all church management and the watchdog committee is set up. I was always curious as to who was on the watchdog committee and now I'll tell you. At that time, Dee Dee Riesdorf was the chairperson, Gail Irwin was the deputy chairperson, Mark Yeager, David Miscavige, Ann Taskett, and Lois Riesdorf were the members of the committee. LRH orders at that time that messengers who hold management posts no longer stand watches. Standing a watch was that period of time when the messengers actually worked in LRH's presence, handling his comm and doing other errands and so forth for him. The folks at INT, that is at CMO INT, are ordered to send two messengers to work with LRH on a more or less permanent basis who are essentially of no great value on management lines. The two people that are chosen are Pat and Annie Broker. Late in January of 1980, another important event occurs, and that is that Mike and Kemma Douglas, LRH's most trusted individuals in the household unit for many years, blow. That leaves behind as the principal terminals working directly with LRH, Pat and Annie, broker, and also a young lady whose name is Clarice. Late in February 1980, the Tampa Grand Jury really gets hot, and LRH is indicted. This is another one of these key moments because LRH is about to flee. Now, ordinarily, of course, he would have taken Mike and Kemma Douglas with him, but they have just the month before blown. So the only people that are there that he can see as being viable to take along with him are Pat and Annie Broker. Now the plan is complete. That's the last time that LRH is going to be seen, and Pat and Annie Broker are essentially right in the middle of all the comm lines. The next key moment in the church history comes in January of 1981, when a telex comes down order to David Miscavige, establishing, quote, Project All Clear. There are 35 liability cases against the church, and a good many of them name LRH as a defendant. This clear project, all clear project, is given top priority over all church business. Included to be as part of this all clear committee will be David Miscavige, Dee Dee and Lois Riesdorf, and Gail Irwin. Norman Starkey and Terry Gamboa will also be part of the project, with David Miscavige as the project operator. Because this is, quote, so confidential and, sec and uh, sensitive, close quote, David Miscavige forms a direct comm line to Pat Broker, bypassing all of the CMO seniors that are above him and actually cutting out the whole CMO. This special comm line pass bypasses the watchdog committee, the CO CMO, and David Miscavige begins to recruit additional people into this all clear committee. Davis, David Miscavige will now systematically begin to eliminate all the other members of the All Clear Committee. In June and July of 1981,
David Miscavige and Pat Broker, along with Annie Broker, decide that the Guardian's office must be eliminated as an independent factor in the church. Around July the 1st, David Miscavige arrange, arranges a meeting with Mary Sue Hubbard based on a lie. He calls her on the phone and implies that he has come for her from LRH. The two get together and he arrives, but the letter that he promised her simply didn't exist. What he did arrive with was a letter that he had had written by the church attorneys stating, erroneously, that Mary Sue's presence as the controller of the church endangered and implicated LRH in all church matters. Based on this letter and other conversation that the two of them had, Mary Sue was eventually persuaded to step down as the controller. David Miscavige's exchanges with Mary Sue were extremely bitter. He was brags about Int for some weeks thereafter about calling her a suppressive bitch and other names. On the 7th of July, 1981, 20 CMO missionaries are sent to St. Hill and the Los Angeles Guardian's office simultaneously in the hopes of simply taking over the Guardian's office. Now you must understand that both the CMO and the Guardian's office did their share of bad things while they were part of the church, but they did act to some degree as a check and balance on one another. This was going to be the elimination of that check and balance and was considered to be a very important operation. In Los Angeles, the takeover goes smoothly until Jane Kember is encountered. Jane is, of course, the guardian worldwide. She has barricaded herself in her office, and she simply refuses to be unseated. By hook or crook, these missionaries manage to get an appointment with her, and she is simply intractable. The missionaries leave, they telex back to Int, and two individuals are sent from Int to Los Angeles, that is from Gilman Hot Springs to Los Angeles, to handle this situation. What is decided is that a fake telex is going to be constructed, allegedly from LRH, that will order that Jane Kember step down and that the CMO take over the Guardian's office. This telex is typed on the spot by the missionaries from Int. It is put in a folder that it contains other legitimate LRH telexes, and another meeting is arranged with Jane Kember. This meeting comes off, she's given this folder to read, she looks through and is unable to distinguish the genuine LRH telexes, which it was presumed she could recognize, from the bogus one. She sees the telex ordering that she step down and that the CMO be, uh, be allowed to take over the Guardian's office, and that action is done. That is the end of the Guardian's office, and now the Commodore's Messenger Org, and ultimately Pat Broker and David Miscavige and Annie Broker now run the entire church. In January and February of 1982, the plans were laid to set up the Religious Technology Center and Authors Services. The purpose of these two corporations, ostensibly, was to hold the trademarks in the event of LRH's death, and in the case of author services, to exploit LRH's written materials and to handle his other personal financial affairs. What actually was accomplished is that the entire church and all Scientologists on a worldwide basis came under the authority of this religious technology center by virtue of the fact that one's authority to use the trademarks could be removed at any time by this group and that this essentially put David Miscavige not only in charge of all of the church, but essentially in charge of every single Scientologist on a worldwide basis. He could simply come down on any Scientologist that he chose to at will. There was some concern that the trademarks of Scientology would pass into the public domain because LRH had been claiming that he'd been off management lines since 1966, and as such, would not have been in, in a position where he was being responsible for and controlling the trademarks for all that period of time, that period of 16 years. The church attorneys were terrified that these copyrights would, or these trademarks rather, would eventually be lost, and so the RTC was a necessity. In fact, of course, what was also going on was that David Miscavige was individuating himself from the church because he feared that the church management structure would eventually find a way to remove him, and by setting up the RTC and putting himself outside the reach of the church, he assured himself of a position that would be irrevocable. In April of 1982, LRH became concerned about his own passing. He sent letters to certain key Sea Org personnel, including a letter to David Mayo, 
passing his technical hat for technical purity and research to David for the period while LRH would be away that would be picking up a new body and growing to adulthood or 20 or 25 years. Verification of that letter exists by way of an RTC missionaire, actually two of them, Kevin True and Neil O'Reilly, who, while discussing this matter with a couple of Scientologists in November of 1983, verified the existence of the letter. We'll play you a piece of that tape now. Yeah, he does have a tech hat. LRH gave him that for the next 20 years or whatever, something like that, in writing. That does exist. That's a fact. It did happen. I trust that will lay to rest once and for all any controversy over whether or not that letter actually exists. Now, because of the personal comm line which exists between LRH and David Mayo, it is necessary for the brokers in Miscavige to find a way to break that comm line off. Mayo, of course, was not a puppet of broker in Miscavige. He was an individual of 15 years' experience in the Sea Org, of a vast amount of tech training, and he simply was not putting up with the nonsense these fellows were putting down the lines. Evidence of the fact that David Mayo was not going on with the Miscavige broker nonsense, of course, is that when the results of the sec checks on Pat Broker were sent up lines and of course were cut off, both the brokers and Miscavige were highly put out at David Mayo for putting this kind of nonsense on LRH's lines. David Mayo, of course, simply would not play along. The next of these major events, these key events, comes in June of 1982. Pat, Brokers, Pat Broker orders the setup of the finance police with Wendell Reynolds as its dictator. Reynolds, after being on post a week or so, sends to the CO CMO Int, at that time John Nelson, a telex which was six feet long, requesting the transfer of more than 250 of the top church executives all into the finance police. Fortunately, Nelson scuttles this. This, of course, is the beginning of the end for Nelson. Around the same period of time, June of 1982, both Broker and Miscavige resigned their positions in the Sea Org and are now full-time non-Sea Org members running the RTC and author services. During the months of July and August of 1982, virtually every senior church executive, except those that are in the influence of Broker and Miscavige, are pulled off post, commeved, and for the most part, declared and expelled. Here's a brief list of the senior executives that were pulled off post. This list is not all inclusive, but I'll give you the highlights. John Nelson, CO CMO International. Kerry Gleason, Executive Director International. Alan Buchanan, Deputy Executive Director International. Mo Samuels, CO of the CMO for Special Unit, that's Gilman Hot Springs. John Axel, Watchdog Committee Member for SMI, that's the Scientology Missions International. Roger Barnes, the ED of Scientology Missions International. Pat Hunter, the Ellerich Communicator International. Bess Sullivan, the CO of the Flag Operations Liaison Office, or FOLO, for East U.S. Emil Gilbert, FOLO, uh, Commanding Officer for FOLO of Canada. Chris Stevens, Commanding Officer of the Special Unit. Peter Warren, Div 6 Executive International. Jay Hurwitz, who was the OEC FEBC Supervisor at FLAG. Julie Gillespie, who was staff of the Senior CS International's office. And David Mayo, the Senior CS International himself. All of these individuals were taken out to Happy Valley. They were variously put on the running program and so forth. And that was the end of church management outside the influence of the brokers in Miscavige. Along with these individuals, Every CO of every FOLO and every commanding officer of every U.S. org has been commapped and replaced. Of the 14 people I named off, almost all of them have been excommunicated. John Nelson was excommunicated, Kerry Gleason, Alan Buchanan. Mo Samuels was given 20 years of no, ser of no services in the church and a conditional excommunication. John Axel 
was ordered to get 2,000 new people into the church before he'd be eligible for service again. Roger Barnes was excommunicated. Pat Hunter was given a conditional excommunication. Beth Sullivan was conditionally excommunicated. Emil Gilbert was excommunicated. Chris Stevens had to get in 1,000 new people and was also conditionally excommunicated. Peter Warren was to get in 2,000 new people and was also conditionally excommunicated. Jay Hurwitz was excommunicated. Julie Gillespie was given no services for 20 years and was conditionally excommunicated. And David Mayo, of course, was excommunicated. It gives you an idea that the elimination of this entire management team was very important and, of course, was completely accomplished. In part three of this tape, we thought we'd take a look at some of these senior management people and find out a little bit more about them. Pat Broker is approximately 33 years old. He's a high school graduate and has actually had a little bit of college. He's had virtually no tech training at all. He's been married three times, four times if you include the time under fictitious names in Sparks, Nevada. He's currently married to Annie Broker and also to Claire Rousseau. He has a very checkered post history, but his posts have principally been in finance. Of course, he was a financial courier, he was the flag banking officer for Boston, and he was the chief of Sea Org Reserves. He was busted off virtually every post he held. Pat is deeply into security and into spy versus spy, and his nickname in the Sea Org has for a long time been 007. He's really enchanted with all spy paraphernalia and gear. He reads spy novels, both fiction and nonfiction books about security and security systems and materials, and it's virtually an obsession with him. Annie Broker is approximately 29 years old. She's been a messenger since 1969. She has education through the seventh grade, no tech training of any kind, and has only recently started on OT3. She's about five foot six, 120 pounds, which, by the way, makes her a little taller than David Miscavige. She's held a variety of admin posts, but most of them came to unfortunate ends. In 1978, she was busted off the COCMO International post for gross incompetence. Later, in 1979, she was busted off the post as deputy commanding officer of the CMO of Clear, uh, Clearwater by Mary Sue, and there was some bad blood between them at that point. She has a history of disassociating her units or areas from the church. I think that's interesting in light of what's going on currently. She of the two, of she and Pat, is the more powerful and confident. She's cold, distant, and has little respect from others, according to those people I've interviewed who know her. She calls Pat the house husband, and he very often checks with her before making any decision that's of any consequence at all. Both Pat and Annie were made watch messengers during late 1979 or early 1980 because they were useless on management posts. It certainly is ironic to find them now both as the most senior management terminals in the church and the Religious Technology Center. David Miscavige is age 24. He's a provisional class 4 auditor, and his education in public school goes up through the 7th grade. He's about 5 foot 4 inches tall, and he weighs about 130 pounds. He's had a variety of nicknames in the Sea Org, but most of them center around his not being especially tall. David Miscavige is completely devoted to Teller H. The brokers use that devotion to get David Miscavige to perform all manner of distasteful acts. Of course, he's also capable of acting distastefully on his own. The eyes-only dispatch which circulated around that was allegedly from David Miscavige to Mark Yeager, the CEO CMO Int, that calls for the squashing of the squirrels and was loaded with four-letter words and strings of invectives, whether or not it is genuine is nonetheless representative of communication from Miscavige at that tone level. He can get things done by fear and intimidation and yelling, etc. It has been said that the most recent church activities, the period of, of high pressure, high force activities, is simply a dramatization of David Miscavige's influence. I've had the opportunity to interview a few of his past seniors, and they report that he has a tendency to wild excesses and constantly needs supervision. Having him in this position where he is virtually unsupervised on management lines causes those people who know him well great concern. To give you some idea of the excess, as well as the control over church finance lines and church personnel, 
that the brokers in Miscavige have, I thought I'd tell you about an activity that went on out at Gilman Hot Springs in the May of 1982. At that time, a clipper ship with three masts full-sized was constructed around the swimming pool there at Gilman Hot Springs. The cost of building the mock clipper ship was over a half million dollars in materials alone. Over $565,000 was spent. All the labor, of course, was Sea Org personnel. This is a rather strange expense, I'm sure you'd agree, to build a ship out in the middle of the California desert. Nonetheless, the expenses of the project was authorized by David Miscavige and Pat Broker, neither of whom, by the way, have any known position in the church. The amazing clipper ship can be seen by anybody. All you have to do is drive out there. It's on Highway 74, just south of Highway 10. The church will even offer tours of the ship to visitors on request. Allegedly, the purpose of the ship was to entertain VIPs, and yet Gilman Hot Springs is this church top secret location. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever why there should be a VIP tourist attraction located in a top security location, and what possible purpose could it have had for this expenditure of a half million dollars in church money? Another example of this kind of excess comes up in a newspaper article from the Knight Ritter News Service called Church of Scientology Buys into Oklahoma Oil Company. What has happened here is that the church has invested about $3.3 million into an Oklahoma oil company called HG&G. The church now apparently owns about 25% of this small exploration company that was formerly known as Highlands, Goodall, and Greer. The article says, after failing to interest industry investors or conventional lending sources, HG&G sold an interest in the company to Church of Scientology Flag Service Organization, Inc., a counseling and training arm of the church in Clearwater, Florida, unquote. I think what's interesting is when a local newspaper in the Florida area went and talked to Ron Norton, who's the CEO of the Flag Service Organization, he said he knew nothing about it. The article goes on to say, quote, Goodall said the religious organization purchased a 25% interest for an undisclosed price. It was tied to a promise to lend financial support for drilling activities, he said. In other words, what the church is going to be doing is giving more money to this oil company for additional drilling as well. I find that that is a rather difficult piece of information to swallow in light of another piece of paper that I have in front of me, Senior HCO PAC Ethics Order Number 145, dated the 2nd of January, 1984. It's addressed to all PAC, that specific area, crew, and it calls for a board of investigation. Do you know what this board of investigation is to investigate? It's to investigate why the staff is on rice and beans. It talks about finding out what orgs are and are not paying the CESO for their meals, and if there is any reference or issue specifying the issue of rice and beans on a daily basis. My information is that the staff members in the PAC area have been on rice and beans for over a month. I find it shocking and appalling that the church can put $3.3 million into oil wells, but it can't even feed its staff. I'm sorry to branch out into opinion on this. I've been trying to just simply report the facts to you as I found them, but that particular story really gets to me. At the beginning of the tape, I promised we'd talk a bit about Ron's Journal 38, and I'm prepared to make good on that promise at this point. The first question I think it's worthwhile to address is whether or not the voice on the tape is LRH or not. I'm not sure it's especially important to be absolutely honest with you. As we'll show you here, the bulk of the statistics and the information which is quoted on the tape lacks significantly in credibility. If that voice is the voice of LRH, it is very clear that Broker and Miscavige and the RTC individuals have been feeding Ron a wide variety of false statistics. If the voice is that of an actor or some other person that's being substituted, well, that person's just being used as a via for the lies. We're having a voice print done, so we should know in the not-too-distant future exactly what the story is. Early on in the tape, the voice says that there's this war going on against the squirrels and that a preliminary injunction has been won in San Diego, California against the California Association of Dianetic Auditors. 
This is, quote, the first victory against the squirrels based on trademarks. Well, I would like to point out that a preliminary injunction is a court document that is issued simply on request. It is preliminary to any hearing of facts, and that this is not a victory at all, but merely a preliminary step to a trial which is coming up in February of this year. If the judge in that instance were to hear that the church is claiming this as some sort of unequivocal victory, I am certain that he would be most displeased. In addition, it's said that this preliminary injunction has shut this person down. First of all, the person's not a squirrel, but purely a splinter. And second of all, they are not shut down at all. As a matter of fact, they're doing better than ever. The tape goes on to mention that the Perth, Australia group, that is the a group run by Eddie Mason in Perth, Australia, is under attack, squirrely on the, fence, on the defense, and has been reduced to next to nothing. That is an absolute and complete fabrication. After all, why would it be necessary for the church to attack something that was next to nothing? The group was formerly a mission. The RTC went into that mission, ripped it up, was really abrasive and rude and dreadful to the people there, and consequently the management of that mission simply decided that they were going to leave the church. Since leaving the church, they've had to move to larger quarters. They are now delivering the entire bridge, and their stats have increased between four and eight-fold just since the spring. Eddie Mason and his crew have just really done a splendid job down there. I'd like to point out something that I think is significant in this tape. There's the following quote on the tape, quote, RTC is promoting their services internationally and is getting the reputation as being the place to get your case run on standard tech when all else fails. I'm curious about that. Has the RTC become a tech delivery unit? Apparently so. I understood that it was, according to its own publications, created to ensure that standard tech was being applied worldwide. Apparently it has failed because because if that quote is to be believed, it set itself up as a tech delivery unit, and it says that you can go to them if all else fails. I thought they were responsible for making sure that all else didn't fail. This bears watching. Here's just one more via between the public and LRH. I heard quite a number of complaints of people that felt that the endless quoting of stats on the tape made it boring. And so I'm going to do the very best I can not to spend a long time futzing with the stats, but I think they are an indication of the degree to which false information is either being given to LRH to give to us or is being given to actors to pass on to us. The stats internally, that is within the tape itself, if you take time to compare one stat to another, they're not consistent. And if you compare those stats with other known sources of statistics, such as the SMI International, International Stat Sheets, you will find that the stats are highly, at least exaggerated or overblown, grossly overstated, or simply utterly false. As an example, let's have a look at the Class 4 org stats. According to the tape, the number of people who started on Dianetic or Scientology services during 1983 was 52,056 or about 1,001 people per week. Yet on the same section, the Division VI stats say that the new people in per week was 14,000, and the number of people that completed free introductory services every week was 4,500. I'd like to point out that if 14,000 come in and 4,500 complete free introductory services, that's only 32%, not a really terrific statistic. Now, of the 4,500 that apparently complete free introductory services, only 1,001 actually go on to start a paid service. So overall, of the 14,000 new people in per week, only 1,001 will ever end up on a service. That's only about 7%. If that isn't living proof that high prices are destroying the church, I don't have any idea what is. And what happens to the nearly 13,000 people every single week who wander away. Taking a look at total international delivery, the number of new starts for the year was apparently 417,311. These are people that started on the bridge. Dividing that out into weeks, that comes to about 8,025 people per week. Earlier we learned that 1,001 started at class 4 orgs. So my question to you is, where did the other 7,024 start? 
They certainly didn't start in missions because the Scientology Missions International stat sheets show a total average first service starts at about 400 per week. Therefore, 6,600 new people are not covered. That statistic is simply utterly false. Per the tape, 53 new missions started up in 1983 for a total of 168. This is another false statistic. According to the Scientology Missions International stat sheets, 26 new missions actually started in 1983, but there were 27 missions that closed up. The total missions at the beginning of the year were 60, the total at the end of the year 59, not 168. Beyond this, the mission network has been financially gutted. Virtually every major stat is significantly down. Gross income is down by over 70 percent, well done auditing hours down 70 percent, student points down more than 50 percent, and first service starts are down almost 80 percent. And why? Because the powerhouse missions, the ones with money, were the ones that were hit by the finance police and the RTC. In 1983, over half of all of the missions, 55 percent, had a weekly gross income of $500 per week or less. That mission network is absolutely decimated, and we have the current management to thank for it. The significance of all this, of course, is that beyond the stats on the tape being questionable, the obvious is that the management is driving the church into the ground. Let's go ahead now and take a look at the book wins. According to the tape, in 1983, Class 4 Org sold an average of 5,000 books per week. If you multiply that out, that comes to 260,000 books per year. Yet the very next statement is that the total number of books and tapes sold in 1983 was, by orgs and missions was 1 million. I would ask the following question. Who sold the other 740,000 books? And the answer was in the missions. One other stat that wasn't quoted had to do with the Modern Science of Mental Health sales campaign. You know, the Dianetic book campaigns with the ads on TV? They sold almost 250,000 books during the year. Unfortunately, the advertising program cost well in excess of $6 million. That's $24 for every book sold. That's what your fees buy. If we could have given away 12 books for every book we sold and still come out financially ahead. A little later on in the tape, there's a series of beeps and boops, and then there's this line apparently that has been established with the International Publishers Computer Network. Well, I checked with Publishers Weekly, that's the major publishing organ for the whole publishing industry, and a couple of other friends I have in the publishing industry, and none of them have ever heard of such a network. That's simply the figment of somebody's imagination. Moreover, the operator says that, quote, if they don't read and acknowledge it, that is the network, they won't be able to clear the interlink, close quote. As a computer professional, I can tell you that any system that cannot be controlled by the operator is not much of a system. A little later on in the tape, there's this quote. The operator says, quote, based on sales and public demand, the whole book trade internationally acclaims L. Ron Hubbard at the undisputed all-time leader in this field, close quote. The field being referred to, of course, is the field of science fiction. Well, I checked with Publishers Weekly and again with my friends in the publishing industry, and they uniformly said to me, what about Isaac Asimov? What about Arthur Clarke? What about Robert Heinlein? What about Gordon Dixon? What they said, generally speaking, was that that was what is in the sales industry called puffing, that is, blowing air around. It's a nice thing to say about Ron. His science fiction accomplishments certainly are noteworthy, but that statement is purely fiction. I don't think it's important or productive to continue to tear the tape apart line by line, but I assure you that it can be done. The tech and, and Scientology as a movement cannot survive in the sea of lies produced by current management. The public sees what goes on. Staff on rice and beans, living at or below the poverty level, certainly does no great shakes for the tech. The current management is willing to say anything to anybody, even to Ron, if it forwards their own ends. They've spread rumors that I've had pneumonia, that's a lie, that I'm coming back to the church, that's also a lie, that David Mayo has brain tumors, that's a lie, that he has cancer, a lie, and more lies and more lies. By the way, David Mayo, who I just saw yesterday, is in absolutely the very best of health. His center is growing at a rate that even the RTC is envious of. 
As a matter of fact, since they opened, they've outgrown their first two sets of quarters, and I predict they'll outgrow their current quarters in another six months, maybe less. Well, we're coming to the end of this tape, and I thought I would put in a few thoughts of my own that perhaps would be useful to you. A number of people have asked me how I came to my decision to leave the church, and I have to tell you that it's based on the axiom that intelligence is the ability to evaluate relative importance. If you take a look at the technology of Scientology, including both the red on white and the green on white, and you compare that in importance to how important the organization is as an entity, I came to the conclusion that the technology was hundreds and hundreds of times more important than the organization. If you have the technology, you can build any kind of an organization you want. I took a look at the current management and realized with gangbang sec checks, with alterations of the bridge and the technology that we've known so well for so many years, that the current management was willing to sacrifice the technology in order to save the organization. I'm not. I'm willing to sacrifice the organization to save the technology. Over the decades, over the millennia, we'll see who made the right choice. The research and the investigation goes on, so keep your eyes open for a new tape. There'll be another one in, not too, in the not-too-distant future. Let me leave you with these few lines from Edward Yashinsky. These were found for me by a very dear friend, and I think they're just the right thing to end this tape. Fear not your enemies, for they can only kill you. Fear not your friends, for they can only betray you. Fear only the indifferent, who permit the killers and betrayers to walk safely on the earth.